Hello world, are we live? We need your confirmation, please. That's not gonna go well. That will go better. Oh man, everything's flashing every color. Uh, night. What? Oh, I just had like my, my, um, my everything flashed red for a moment. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they say they see and see us and hear us. Okay. Okay. So that. So that where are you? I am in a hotel room in Las Vegas. Uh, Annie Binaria Blaze. Many of you know her from uh, CosmoQuest, Betty Mappers, and stuff. She's marrying favorite human this week, and so all of us are out Aww. here for her wedding. Now, were you able to see the, the eclipse last night? No, we were completely clouded out because this is me and this is my life. Yeah. You just, like, you bring the, the weather with you. Yeah, we were totally clouded out as well. It's too bad. So we've got 800, almost 900 days to wait now for the next yeah. total lunar eclipse. I... I mean, I'm used to there being one or two per year and just like the freakish geometry. It's, yeah. yeah, this it's is a this is a this is a drought. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's sort of like the universe there's is a, like there, no there's more clearly a big delay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's clearly a big delay in our in our audio. So we'll have to adapt. OK. I will wait until you have clearly finished speaking, and we will apologize to the audience uh, when we're doing the show. Cause and Rich. It... Yes. It'll be a big for for Richard. So anyway, he'll but he'll be able to clean it up and make it sound okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, let me know when you're ready to start. So I okay. now I'm assuming we'll wrap up. Like I don't think we do. We don't have a lot of time today. So should we just we'll do the recording and then wrap things up? Yeah. Okay. I'm just I'm just getting auditioned to open somewhere, please. <laughs> I'm on a single monitor and it is it is not happy. I I have the ability to like also be on my laptop uh, not not on my laptop, also on my iPad, but that just seemed like it would be tempting fate, so I'm not I'm not doing that. Uh let me know when you're ready. I'm, I'm getting closer by the second. <laughs> New audio file. Uh, AC. There's just a delay between what I say and when my lips move. <laughs> What's today's episode number? 659. All right. I'm pressing record. Yeah, this is the worst possible situation where you're in a hotel room hosting my Starlink stream. Couldn't be yeah. any worse. This is true. All right. All right. You're ready to press record? I have pressed record on all the devices. Okay. I have done the same. All right. Let us begin. Astronomy Cast, episode 659, Clear Skies and Bright Satellites. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. I want to apologize to our audience if today's quality isn't what you are used to. Uh, one of our team members, Annie Wilson, is getting married this week and uh, all of us are in Vegas to celebrate. So I'm coming to you from Hotel Internet, um, mm -hmm. which is not the best, but the show will go on. So you might not know, but every time a person signs up as a patron, patron, a patron to Universe Today, I send them an email asking them to do an interview with me. And it's actually talking to me. Like, 
we're all having a Zoom meeting and I'm asking you a bunch of questions about where you found Universe Today and so on. And I would say about half of the people first found out about Universe Today through Astronomy Cast. Wow. So, yeah. So for those of you who have sort of followed this journey from Astronomy Cast to Universe Today, thank you. I really appreciate it. For those of you who don't realize, like every episode, it's so funny, every episode I go like, I'm the publisher of Universe Today. And people are like, I didn't realize that, that you did Universe Today or what this Universe Today thing was. So do I, maybe I need to say Universe Today 10 times a show or something, I don't know. Anyway, but it's been, it's been very interesting to have this conversation with people. So just a secret bonus, if you didn't know, if you sign up for my Patreon over at patreon.com slash universe today, I will ask you to talk to me and it will actually be me and we will actually talk. That's amazing. All right. I need to start doing that for Cosmo Quest, I think. That's amazing. I love It is that so much idea. fun. Yeah, it's so much fun. And you just like, after you read all, you see all these trolls, all these nasty people out there on the internet, people yelling and fighting each other, and you just get like 15 minutes of pure bliss talking to wonderful people about interesting things and just restores your faith in humanity. So yeah, I, anyone who does run a Patreon, like talk to your fans. Yeah. It's so It's so much fun. Now, light pollution is a big problem, and it's only getting worse. Not just in your cities, but everywhere, thanks to increased satellite constellations. How bad is the problem, and how can we fix it? And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. So you're right now traveling. You're in Las Vegas. Yes. What Bortle number would you give the place? Oh man, how bad does it go? It's it's not quite Times Square or that intersection in Tokyo with the crazy crosswalks. But <laughs> yeah. There's there's not a lot of stars up there or planets. Yeah. It's just kind of a few things. And for better or worse, unless there's like a Starlink train going over where I am right now, you're not even going to see the satellites because of all those lights pointed up on the buildings, pointed down on the ground that are scattering light into the sky. And actually, like Vegas is a island of of light pollution in an ocean of pretty dark skies in the yeah. west side of the United States. Like if you look at a map of the light pollution in the US, there is this clear line between the west and the east. East is a nightmare. I, it's funny. So I, I talk to people about how to find dark skies. And, and so I pull up the dark sky finder map, which overlays light pollution on top of Google Maps. And you can sort of yeah. zip around and look at various places. And I'm looking for stuff that is green. Like the best you can have is, is black. Then after yes. that is blue and then green. Green lets you see the Milky Way. If you're in green, you can see the Milky Way. And for people on the on the west side, it's easy. You just go in any direction for about 10 minutes and you should be able to see the Milky Way. For people in the east, it can be an hour to get somewhere, two hours to get somewhere where they can actually see the Milky Way. And for people in Europe, there's oh, nowhere can't, they can really. go. There's like Get on a boat. In, in Portugal, there's a dark sky sight. In Spain, there's a dark sky sight. But they're not dark the way we're used to dark here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you're in, say, the Netherlands. Yeah. I, I don't know. The Alps? Like, there's just nowhere to go. It's, it's terrifying. And I think a third of humanity now can't see the Milky Way. Yeah. What, what is the darkest place you think you've ever been? Australia, no question, by far. Okay. Yeah, hands down, uh, yeah. Yeah, for, for me, and this is so bittersweet in these times that we live in, uh, back when I was in high school, I was on a people-to-people -people youth exchange, and uh, a whole group of us astronomy nerds went to the USSR uh, to be at an exchange at their six-meter telescope, which at the time was the largest in the world. And as part of the exchange, they took us camping up on a glacier, or near a glacier. We were in the rock field at the base of the glacier. Wow. And and being a moody, slightly goth in my head, but never had the willpower to do the makeup kid, 
I, I decided one night I was going to go off by myself and sit on a rock and just stare at the stars. And that was the first time in my life I've ever seen a satellite. And, and to me, it was this magical moment of figuring out, wait, that moving thing is not an airplane. And then just like falling into the sky and seeing all these things I'd never seen before, being completely lost because there were too many stars for me to easily find my way around. And I'd grown up like desperately trying to find Andromeda from my driveway in New England. And that was not a thing that I ever succeeded at. To, to go from that to this dark site was amazing. Yeah, I, so growing up, there had always been satellites going overhead, and my dad would teach me to to find them as we go out at night. And I guess being in Canada, we're we're farther north, and so mm -hmm. when we're in the summer in Canada, then the then the satellites are in sunlight for longer than they would be for more southern latitudes, and and so during the summer you could be sitting out in the warm evening and just watch these satellites go overhead we can get three passes of the international space station in the summer 90 minutes apart separated wow. in different spots in the sky and we definitely get starlink trains as we're going by so you know i think like the idea of of dark skies and and the light pollution has been it's been around for a long time. Like it's been around for probably 50, 75 yeah. years. Like it's been around for a long time and it's just been getting worse and worse. What is the state of, of light pollution today? There are United Nations committees working in um, concert with the International Astronomical Union and the International Dark Skies Association, IDA, to try and identify places in all the nations of the world, and they're not gonna succeed in all the nations, but trying to find places where the skies still allow you to see Andromeda with your unaided eye, still allow you to make out messier objects easily, and take those sites with a visual magnitude of getting down to six if your eyes are good, seven if you're an, a crazy eye person. Some people can do that. I learned that and it was shocking. Yeah. Um, they're yeah. trying to find those places and turn them not just into national parks, but into internationally recognized dark sites, the same way we have UNESCO historical sites. Now we're starting to have essentially the equivalent for dark places. and. And this is in recognition of if we don't set aside the places that are dark, we're going to lose them forever. The same way one might once have set aside national parks to be preserves of animals. Now we're preserving the sky as well as the landscape. All right, we're gonna talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. Now, I don't know if you had heard the news, but New Zealand is thinking of trying to make the whole country a dark sky preserve. That would be amazing. There, there's already a dark sky preserve. Uh, I just lost the name of the city. I'm not moving until I find the name of the city or someone. Christchurch. There's already a dark sky site not too far away from Christchurch. And I, I haven't been to that half of New Zealand, but there there are more sheep by like orders of magnitude in new zealand than humans and it is a place that celebrates its countryside you can actually hike all the way from the southernmost tip of the island islands take a ferry to get between the two islands and then walk the rest of the way with little cabins for hikers all along the way. It is designed to allow people to celebrate the, the landscape, which is why Lord of the Rings could so successfully <laughs> be filmed there. And it's easy to preserve the sky if you don't have a lot of people and you say, okay, when the people do start encroaching on this land, we're going to require that construction of new properties be built in such a way that we're not taking away from our ability to see the sky. 
And there are some places that are demonstrating that this is completely feasible. You look at Tucson, Arizona, yes. which is near a lot of the observatories, and the whole place is designed with a respect for the night sky. The lights point down, they use, they, they're dim-ish, um, and any excessive light that's being sent up into the sky is discouraged. And yeah. you can still get around at night in Tucson, and yet you have these skies that let you see the Milky Way pretty much even when you're in the, any part of the city. And so it's not that it's not impossible. And I think, you know, we had expected that as the new revolution in the LED lights came out, their lower power, but the same amount of light, plus their ability to be pointed a lot better, would turn the tide of light pollution. But it didn't happen. Yeah. If anything, it got worse. They yeah. just said, OK, well, you know, with less power, we can put out more light. So let's put out more light. And so they swapped out dimmer light fixtures with brighter light fixtures and so actually the light pollution problem is is getting a lot worse in a lot of cities and bluer that is an unexpected mm. outcome because different colors of light reflect in different ways scatter in different ways and as many of us have encountered it's super easy to get a bunch of super bright on the blue side of the spectrum uh, LED lights and just create motion sensors and floodlights and I I know that I currently have six extremely bright LED lights with solar panels on them in my front yard because they were pointed at Halloween decorations. Now they will eventually come down although we've decided the skeleton in the tree is going to get a Santa hat and he stays there. But when you get to the point right. that you can get a solar powered, very blue LED light, you can no longer make energy arguments. Right, right. Um, so let's talk about the satellite problem. And, and obviously, you know, at this point, there are various companies, especially SpaceX with SpaceX with Starlink that are adding hundreds if not thousands of satellites every year yeah. we're up to i think like three thousand almost four thousand starlinks and they're planning to get to forty two thousand satellites uh amazon is planning to do its own version so what impact are these satellite networks going to have on light pollution what we're running into is these satellites are typically in low Earth orbit so that you can have low latency connections, not that this particular connection feels all that low latency. And Right, I'm on Starlink right now. Yeah, and, and I'm on hotels, so I have no idea what it's using. But these low latency connections require satellites that are closer to the planet. And because they're closer to the planet, they're able to appear brighter. So what's happening is when light hits a surface, if it's a perfectly smooth surface, the angle the light comes in equals the angle that the light comes out. And in that scenario, you end up with super bright satellites because the light can get beamed back. Now, luckily, perfectly reflected surfaces aren't really a thing. So in general, what we're looking at is sunlight hits satellite, scatters out in all directions due to the roughness of the surface, and then we have a one over distance squared relationship between us and how bright that satellite appears. Now, if something gets fainter as the square of the distance, if you double the distance, it's going to be four times fainter. Now, on the other side, if you bring it closer, it's going to be all that much more bright. All these satellites in low Earth orbit are substantially brighter than the ones that are in geosynchronous orbit many, many times higher up. So right, there's right. that factor. Now, there was some interesting research that I was looking into. Astronomers have been very carefully measuring the brightness of the Starlinks. And without any kind of bright 
brightness mitigation features. They're about 6.5 magnitude. So mm -hmm. beyond the ability of most people, even in the darkest skies, to be able to see. Once they get to and their final with, orbit. Once they get to their final orbit. Yeah, when they're going up there in a train, they're very bright. Many people have, yeah. have seen them. Once they, once they get to their final orbit, they're essentially impossible to see with the unaided eye. There's the visor sat version, which it looks like they've abandoned. Uh, which get it even darker. Like, I think it's like magnitude 7.5, yeah. which is beyond the eyesight of anybody. There's also the ones they painted, which are like 6.8, 6, something like that. So they're all in the 6.5 to 7.5 magnitude range, which is you need a binoc pair of binoculars to be able to, to see them. And so I think that great worry that you would stand outside and you would see this grid of satellites orbiting around planet earth all the time wasn't warranted but there absolutely has been an impact on astronomy or it is beginning now and we're starting to really recognize what the true ramifications of this are what's the impact what we're seeing is it is getting significantly more difficult to take long exposures where you don't have a satellite passing over one or more of the objects that you're interested in. So say that you're looking at a galaxy cluster. Well, if you get a Starlink satellite passing right over the galaxies you're interested in, that's no longer data you can use. So you have to take more exposures to get the same amount of uninterfered with photons from the galaxies. So if one in every 10 images is going to have a satellite knocking out an object in your busy galaxy cluster field, uh, that's going to end up increasing by 10% how many images you have to take. It's not actually that bad, that's just back of the envelope math, but Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's going to have a multiple percentage of impact as near as we can tell right now. And while we don't have a grid orbiting our planet, I, I went camping during the summer and was shocked at the number of satellites that are now in the early evening sky. Luckily, it does mm -hmm. mostly impact for mid latitudes, the early evening and the hours before dawn, such that if you're out all night observing with your eyes during a meteor shower, you can tell when the sun is going to come up because the number of satellites gets higher again. Right. All right, we're gonna talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. Yeah, I think it's really important to clarify the problem because the satellites are only visible when the satellite is illuminated while the earth is in shadow so when it's nighttime you still need to have the satellite illuminated and that only occurs at just after sunset and just before sunrise and in regions that are relatively close to the horizon which are typically fairly terrible places to point your telescope anyway you want to point your telescope straight up just you can go through the minimal satellites. amount of atmosphere you can get satellites straight overhead though just just to be clear it it all depends oh. on the orbit they're in and how high up they are the wild thing is that and where the you higher are up yes so yeah the, yeah. the so higher up if you're in canada you yeah so if you're in canada which has a fairly high latitude then you're closer to the pole and there's a much better chance that sunlight in the summertime is going to be peeking over the top of the planet for hours. And that's why mm -hmm. I was mentioning for the show, we could see the International Space Station on multiple passes because the sunlight is, is essentially going over top of planet Earth while Earth is, you know, where we are is in shadow. But you get the same problem in the Southern Hemisphere in places like Chile, where all the big telescopes in the world are, they're closer to the South Pole, and they have the same problem. So um, it also really matters with the searches for, say, dangerous asteroids, which are, which are yes. caught in the glow of the sun. You, can, you have to search for them near the horizon, near the sun, shortly after sun set shortly before sunrise that's the only time that you can find these 
potentially planet killing asteroids and that's a problem but but one other problem is the just the increased sky glow and i think this was this was sort of unexpected can you talk yes. about that so you you have two different things going on so first of all you have the the specific light coming off of the satellite that allows you to see that bright streak through your image but as, as i was saying the light reflected off of satellites that have a rough surface it's it's coming out in in an expanding cone and assuming flat surface there's lots of geometry involved that light coming through the atmosphere is then getting scattered around by the molecules and atoms in our atmosphere and so just like sunlight gets scattered to create the blue light we see during the day as our blue sky the scattered light coming off of the satellites is causing not a blue sky our eyes can see but a change in how dark the sky appears because to a telescope because of all that scattered light within the atmosphere even in the night and so you're getting light pollution over top of these observatories even though they're far away from any right. city any artificial lights because now these satellites are everywhere and this problem is just starting to appear but it's going to get worse and worse and worse as there are more satellites in the sky it's it's something where i often find myself asking do you want to be on coruscant this is how we get coruscant and while they have right. flying cars more at the uh, skyscraper height this zipping around of satellites in low earth orbit is going to eventually create a world that looks like it has a swarm of gnats flying around it to not too distant space explorers I think about Star Trek and you see like the giant shipyards and, and dock facilities. Yeah. You think, boy, what would be the light pollution of that thing? Right? <laughs> it would just be yeah. this gigantic gleaming object that would be visible and casting shadows. And it would be like the full moon every night, every time this thing passed overhead. The, it's the downsides you don't think of when you're excited about your, your Star Trek future. One, one crazy calculation I ran preparing for the show that we will eventually record, I promise. Um, when, when we were figuring out different things to calculate, I calculated how big would the International Space Station appear if it was at geostationary orbit. Right now, someone with a really good 14 inch or larger telescope on the planet has the ability to resolve out the solar panels and the basic shape of the International Space Station because it's in low Earth orbit. Well, yeah. if you they've seen it, astronauts spacewalking. Right. Now, if you boost the International Space Station all the way up to geostationary orbit, it's about an arc second across. So if you build your shipyard out at greater than geostationary distances you would have this like pinprick of stupidly bright light like venus moving through the sky and i i love this idea that something so big could appear so small from the surface of the world but i mean reality is they'll probably put it a whole lot lower down you can imagine doing like in our sci-fi fantasy future, putting it actually at geostationary so that you can do a space elevator. Um, the future's gonna get weird for the next three generations, assuming we <laughs> yeah. don't kill our planet. So yes, Star Trek, please. Please, right. now. So, <laughs> um, so what can be done? Because I, you know, we've had this conversation before that on the one hand, satellite internet has the potential to provide high-speed internet access to a huge portion of humanity yes. and on the other side the price that we're going to pay is is a loss to ground-based telescopes what can be done to solve this problem at least to some degree so the shape of the satellite matters a lot in how much light it it's able to reflect back down to the planet so if you can change the profile 
so that the smallest possible surface area is facing our planet. That will help. Um, having rough surfaces helps. Having surfaces that don't reflect easily helps, except when you start getting into the infrared, because if it doesn't reflect light well, it's going to warm up. Right, um, it heats up. Yeah. Right. So or reflects lots. radio waves. I mean, so I think like the most important thing in the short term is to provide real time telemetry information to the telescopes, to the observatories. So right now, the there is no schedule for when yes. various satellites going to be at various locations. And yet it should be, in fact, people have started to try and make this, but this is something that should just be supplied by the satellite operators. It should be part of like, if you want a license, you have to provide real time down to the nanosecond information about where your satellites are. And so then you integrate that with the giant observatories and then they know that they can take pictures and pause for one second while yes. the satellite is going to move through the object that they're attempting to image. It doesn't have to be the whole field of view. If they're just trying to get one little galaxy cluster, you just wait a second before you start your observation run, and you will then get the data that you need. This should be possible, and this should have been mandated. And yes. I can't believe that we're at this place where the telescopes aren't getting real-time information about the satellites that they can then adjust. You know, the classic example is yeah. the the machine guns that timed so they don't shoot the propellers of the airplanes. You can I just time everything. Yeah, and I've I've seen that you could restore like that would be useful just in general across all observatories, and you would get back pretty much all of the lost time from the satellites passing through your data you won't get back the sky glow right. and there's kind of no place to hide from that and obviously you know people are going to say well just go to space but ground-based telescopes have their place in right. modern science and so we can't just say hey let's turn everything into into space they have to mm -hmm. work together and i think they should have put mandates made requirements and we would be in a totally different place with a much better partnership between science and internet satellite providers. Right. The the one type of device that we just aren't yet to a point of being able to put in orbit at all is the giant spectrographs that we use to get detailed analysis of the composition of fairly bright objects. These spectrographs are often the size of the basement underneath an observatory where equipment is very carefully put together where that light is moving tens of meters around in all of its its forays to eventually land on a detector spread out into that perfect rainbow we can analyze those require tweaking they require trial and error to get everything absolutely perfect and i don't want to even try and imagine doing all of the optical bench alignments that are necessary with with building something like that in space at this point in our development of human construction on orbit so fix your house fix yes. your street lights yes. fix your country to yes. give us back that night sky and 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 try to figure out how to bring balance to our need to light our environment to communicate with each other and our ability to explore the universe they can coexist people just have to make this a priority it's an it's an environment like any other and let's stop yeah. trashing it yes thanks exactly. pamela thank you fraser and I have humans that I, once again, forgot to open the window. Sorry, Rich. Sorry, Ali. Sorry, everybody who is now watching me frantically go, oh, shoot, I forgot to open that window. I always forget to open. Beth, thank you for putting the information together. Um, today is... I am in the wrong folder. Let's try this again.
there. All right, so I have a whole lot of people to thank this week. This week I would like to thank William Krauss, Matthias Hayden, Claudia Mastriani, Jeff Wilson, Cooper, Grigory Singleton, Tim McMacken, Kenneth Ryan, Alex Rain, Iran Zegrev, uh, Elian Mon, Paul Disney, Michael Regan, Ninja Nick, Scott Briggs, Benjamin Mueller, Stephen She Welter, Michelle Kuhn, uh, Veronica Cure, Omar Del Riviera, Dean McDaniel, Don Mundus, Peter J. Alex Alexanderson, Matt Ruchter, Benjamin Car Carrier, Jim McGeehan, Antisor, Mark Stephen Raznak, Moose and Deer, Abraham Castrell, Mark H. Wittick, Philip Grand, Father Prax, Shirsium, uh, Frodo Tannenbaum, uh, Bruce Amazine, Dustin Ralph, Paul L. Hayden, GForce 184, Sean Matz, Andrew Stevenson, Planetar, Gabriel Galfin, Stephen Coffey, Smansky, Glenn McDavid, Dwight Ilk, Karthik Vekatraman, Brent Kiernop, Sam Brooks and his mom. Thank you. Uh, James Roger, the mysterious Mark, uh, Josh Elleth, John Drake, Kemi Racian, Nat Detweiler, and the arm, the air major. Thank you all. You allow us to do what we do, which weeks like this are going to require a lot of our editing team. So thank you for fueling right. our editing team. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. And then they saved. Okay. Um, we should probably wrap things up, but if people yeah. are interested in things you're working on, where what's happening? So I actually had a kid's book come out that I wrote with one of my really good friends who's uh, a, a education researcher and another one who's a lunar researcher. And the three of us put together a book about the moon aimed at early elementary school. And um, it just reminds these kids that they're the ones who are eventually going to be a stands. Um, I'm deeply Is that interested. your first book? Yeah. Yeah. This is your first book. Congratulations. And it's very pretty, very, very pretty. We worked <laughs> very hard to get the illustrations as accurate as they could be. Um, so yeah, if you have a kid in your life, it's just called The Moon. It's uh, by the DK label of, uh, Random, of Penguin Random House Publishing. Sandlin Buxner's the first author, I'm the second. Um, and it had the most delightful contract I've ever signed. The contract was labeled, Gay, the Moon. <laughs> so gay. So All right, happy. thanks, Pamela. And okay. uh, we will see you uh, next week, hopefully back at yes. your regular studio. Yes, that is the plan. All right. Okay. All right, we'll see you later. Thanks, everybody, for this weird time. And we'll see you